Hey, Hello Internet! It's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. And for today's topic, I'm going to start with a pop quiz. All right, get the pen and paper ready. Um, if I were to ask you, who was ruling Numenor at the time that the One Ring was being forged? Would you know the answer? I will say this, I did not. When I think of Numenor, I think of kind of the end, the downfall of Numenor, right? Toward the end of the Second Age, you got Er Farazan, it gets corrupted by Sauron, bad things happen, the island goes whoosh, and uh, Elendil flees to Middle-earth. And that's kind of what a lot of people know about Numenor. You might know about the beginning of Numenor. Uh, Elros, Elrond's brother, you know, is the first king of Numenor. But in the middle of the Second Age, say around 1600, which is when the Amazon series is going to focus, who's going to be in that Amazon series representing Numenor? And that ruler is Tar Telperion. Uh, she is the second ruling queen of Numenor at that time. Uh, and so I thought today I would talk about who's ruling Numenor at the time that the Amazon series is likely to be having its first and second seasons. We can't really talk about Tar Telperion without backing up a little bit to show the influence on our queen of Numenor. And I think you need to go all the way back to Tar Aldarion who rules in 883, I think is when he starts ruling Numenor. Now that's going to be before the Amazon series, almost certainly. I don't think they're going to be covering Aldarion's kingship. Flashbacks, perhaps, but it seems more likely that what we're talking about for the Amazon series is something around 1500, 1600, up to 1700. That 200 year gap, 1500 to 1700 is going to be your first and second seasons, maybe, of uh, the Amazon series. So this is predating that, but it's very important. Uh, Tolkien wrote a lot, actually, about Aldarion and Arendis, his wife. Uh, you see a lot of this in the Unfinished Tales. He unfortunately passed away before finishing his kind of tragic love story between these two. Um, it is not an uplifting tale, let's put it that way, and it affects the rest of the lineage of the Numenorean kings for several years to follow. So Aldarion is a very complex character. He's, he's a hero in many ways, um, but he also is someone that chose the sea uh, over his family, uh, and there's a lot of strife that that causes. I'm going to read you a little uh, excerpt here about Aldarion from the Unfinished Tales. He was a great mariner and shipbuilder, and himself sailed often to Middle-earth, where he became the friend and counselor of Gilgalad. Owing to his long absences abroad, his wife, Erendis, became angered, and they separated in the year 882. His only child was a daughter, very beautiful, and Calame. In her favor, Aldarion altered the line of succession so that the eldest daughter of a king should succeed if he had no sons. This change displeased the descendants of Elros, and especially the heir under the old law, Saranto, Aldarion's nephew. So, Aldarion's going off to sea. He's meeting with the elves at Linden, specifically Gilgalad. He also meets with uh, Círdan. And he's away so much that it causes this huge rift with his, his wife and his dad. His dad at that point is actually the king, uh, Tar Meneldur. So at this point, Aldarion is a prince. Um, but he has this you know, obsession with the sea uh, that never goes away. And it's interesting that he actually does change the laws of succession. So his daughter, and Calame, we'll talk about her in a second, she becomes the first queen of Numenor and rules for a long, long, long time. And Aldarion's nephew, Saranto, he gets relegated to the dustbin of history. He was that close to being a king, but no, the laws got changed so that just so that he couldn't take over, basically. Here's a little bit more about Aldarion's motivation for traveling to Middle-earth. Of his first journey, little is known, save that he made the friendship of Círdan and Gilgalad. 
and journeyed far in Linden and the west of Eriador, and marveled at all that he saw. He did not return for more than two years, and Maneldur was in great disquiet. It is said that his delay was due to the eagerness he had to learn all that he could of Círdan, both in the making and management of ships, and in the building of walls to withstand the hunger of the sea. So Aldarion does eventually return back to Numenor, has this child, and Calame with Arendis, um, and at some point that urge to go back to the sea returns. But when Encalame was close to four years old, Aldarion at last declared openly to Arendis his desire to sail again from Numenor. She sat silent, for he said nothing that she did not already know, and words were in vain. He tarried until the birthday of Encalame, and made much of her that day. She laughed and was merry, though others in that house were not so. And as she went to her bed, she said to her father, Where will you take me this summer? I should like to see the white house in the sheep land that Mamiel tells of. Aldarion did not answer, and the next day he left the house, and was gone for some days. When all was ready, he returned and bade Arendis farewell. So, yikes. He waits till his daughter's birthday. She's like, Dad, awesome! Where are we going to go on that trip? He's like, mm. Doesn't answer her. Leaves. Comes back. Doesn't say goodbye to the daughter. Just says goodbye to Arendis, who is already kind of resigned to the fact that he's going. Um, and so there is uh, some major emotional damage that's happening in this family right now. That goes on. He makes a few different trips. He's gone for years at a time. And now we cut to, uh, at like age 19, and Calame is made heir, right? This is line of succession thing. And it's like, you are the princess. Just know you're going to be the queen one day. And so we see some more here interactions uh, where and Calame and Arendis and Aldarion are a dysfunctional family. That evening, and Calame said suddenly to her mother, is my father also called the Lord Aldarion? He was, said Arendis, but why do you ask? Her voice was quiet and cool, but she wondered and was troubled, for no word concerning Aldarion had passed between them before. And Calme did not answer the question. When will he come back, she said. Do not ask me, said Arendis. I do not know. Never, perhaps. But do not trouble yourself. For you have a mother, and she will not run away while you love her. And Calame did not speak of her father again. I should note that at this time in Numenor, it is customary for the current king or queen to hand over rulership before they die. So it's not like, on my deathbed, now here's the scepter, you take over. They, they hand over the scepter while they're still alive. And so there's, all, there's like an overlap. In this case, Aldarion is still alive when he hands over the scepter to Ancalame and she becomes queen. Another note to make is that Arendis, during Aldarion's absence, she does move inland. She loves the fields and the forests of the inland, and he loves the sea, which you know is emblematic of the strife in their relationship. But they move inland, uh, she and Ancalame. Uh, eventually, Ancalame is living inland by herself and because she's the princess she starts getting courted uh, and basically is just swearing off all suitors I think because she sees this bad example of a relationship with her parents doesn't want to really repeat that but inevitably she does actually fall in love with this shepherd boy turns out it's not a shepherd boy it's uh, the son of a noble house uh, that has been disguised as a shepherd boy to uh, deceive her. His name is Halakar. And when she finds out that he's been deceptive, she's not pleased with that, obviously. Who would be? Um, but uh, ends up marrying him out of a political convenience. Uh, I'm going to read you a passage here that uh, sets up why she marries Halakar, and they have a kid. She reigned for 205 years, longer than any ruler after Elros. She surrendered the scepter in 1280, died in 1285. She long remained unwed, but when pressed by Sorrento to resign, in his despite, she married in the year 1000 
Halakar, son of Halatan. After the birth of her son Anarion, there was strife between Enkalame and Halakar. So they, she basically married Halakar to have a son. They had a son, and then they were like Splitsville, basically. Um, so her son's name is Anarion. As we'll see, there's an Anarion many years later uh, when uh, Elendil has his kids, Isildur and Anarion. This is uh, Tar Anarion. Something else that Enkalame does during her rulership uh, really starts impacting the relationship with Middle-earth. I think it's clear that she resented the elves because they were more important to her dad than she was. And so she has no love for the elves. It is told that after the death of Tar Aldarion in 1098, Tar and Calame neglected all her father's policies and gave no further aid to Gilgalad in Linden. Her son, Anarion, who was afterwards the eighth ruler of Numenor, first had two daughters. They disliked and feared the queen and refused the heirship, remaining unwed, since the queen would not, in revenge, allow them to marry. Anarion's son, Surion, was born the last and was the ninth ruler of Numenor. So there you go. Uh, her son, Anarion, has three kids, two daughters, and then the third kid is his son, Surion, who becomes king. Those two daughters, as you just saw there, uh, they, they don't get married either. They're forbidden to by Encalame, who is still alive at this point. And for some reason, they refuse to take on the scepter of rulership, right? Uh, you know, the laws have been changed so that women can be rulers. But the oldest daughter and the second oldest daughter both refuse that rulership. Now, why that is, is unclear. Um, perhaps they resent their grandmother so much that they just don't want to be like her, they don't want to be involved in politics, and they just want to step back. Perhaps uh, Anarion, who, you know, he's also the son of a troubled relationship, and Calame and Halakar didn't get along and split up. Maybe he's like, you know what, he's rejecting his mother's uh, way of ruling and so says no I'm going to go back to the old ways where it's the eldest son rules and so basically he insists that his daughters get passed over um, it, it's hard to tell we don't know exactly why but for whatever reason the two daughters refuse rulership Surion accepts it and he becomes the king after Tar Anarion and Tar Surion is king until I believe it's 1556 which means that he is king at least when the rings of power are starting to be forged, right? The, when Celebrimbor and Sauron are getting together and forging, you know, the dwarven rings, the human rings, um, in that time period, Tarsurian is king of Numenor. But aid is really not being given over to the Middle Earth. Uh, that's the policy that it was initiated by Encalame seems to still be in place. And there is a sad coda on the end of the tale of Alderian and Arendus, uh, which I'll read you here about the passing of Arendus. Of Arendus, it is said that when old age came upon her, neglected by Encalame and in bitter loneliness, she longed once more for Alderian, and learning that he was gone from Numenor on what proved to be his last voyage, but that he was soon expected to return, she journeyed unrecognized and unknown to the haven of Romena. There, it seems, she met her fate. But only the words, Erendus perished in water in the year 985, remain to suggest how it came to pass. So, it's tragic, tragic. Um, but a couple of things there. One, uh, and Calame is also angry at her mom. So it's not that it's like she harbors all of her anger toward Aldarion. Uh, she seems to have not gotten along with her mother as well, because it says there that neglected by Encalame and in bitter loneliness. Um, so that family just completely fractured. And so she goes to the harbor to see her former true love come back into shore at Romena. And it says she perished in water. I think the implication is she committed suicide. She leaped into the water that had stolen her love from her all those years ago. 
uh, and so perished to just, uh, ah, oh, uh, I'm not crying. Anyway, it's a terrible end. Plus, think how that affects Anne Calame, um, assuming she eventually found out about that. Uh, you know, her father abandoned her, her mother commits suicide because of that abandonment. Uh, she had to be racked with all kinds of negative emotions from that. She carries that on to her granddaughters who resent her and she resents them and forbids them to marry. Like it's not worth it. All of that is being carried on as well as the, and by the way, we ain't uh, chatting with Middle Earth anymore. So Sirion has a daughter, Telperion. He also has a younger son, Isilmo. But in this case, it's Telperion that accepts the scepter of leadership and becomes queen. She is the second queen of Numenor. And her rulership is right in the time that this Amazon series is going to take place. There's not a ton of verbiage about her uh, in Tolkien's notes, but it says, She was the second ruling queen of Numenor. She was long-lived, and she would wed with no man. Therefore, after her day, the scepter passed to Minister. He was the son of Asilmo, the second child of Tar Sirion. Tar Telperion ruled for 175 years until 1731 and died in that same year. All right, those dates are going to be very important here in a second because there's some discrepancy in there. But uh, interesting that she died the same year that she gave the scepter over, right? We've seen with previous rulers that they're willing to give over power before they die. Not in her case. She, she clings to that power. Also, she does not marry. So again, it's that tradition that was started by Encalame uh, and just seemed to be passed on to the women in this ruling family that uh, the women were not going to share the power by marrying. And maybe there's a little bit of, a, in the real world context, perhaps say Queen Elizabeth, who did not marry during her rulership of England uh, because she didn't want to give over that power. She knew that in this in the society she, in which she lived, perhaps her her ability to rule relied on her not marrying. So because Telperion doesn't marry, doesn't have kids, when it comes time to pass the scepter, it goes to her nephew, who becomes Tar Minister. Minister means Tower Watcher, and he was so named because he built a tower on the western shores of Numenor to, to gaze west. He thence would spend great part of his days gazing westward, for the yearning was growing strong in the hearts of the Numenorians. He loved the Eldar, but envied them. He it was who sent a great fleet to the aid of Gilgalad in the first war against Sauron. So, 1700 of the Second Age is when the Numenorian navy arrives in Middle-earth and defeats Sauron. For the first time. So keep in mind when our Pharazan comes to Middle Earth and takes Sauron prisoner, that's happening like 1500 years after this. So this is 1700, the ring's been forged, Sauron like, wreaks havoc in Eriador, um, and then it's up to the Numenorians to come and save the day. And they do so in 1700, and the person who sends that navy is Tar Minister. Now here's where there's this discrepancy that I mentioned. So Tolkien is fairly clear when he talks about how Telperion gave over the scepter only in the last year of her life, which was 1731. And yet, we have Tar Minister. You put the Tar in front of your name because that's king. Tar Minister, theoretically the king of Numenor, is sending a fleet in 1700. So how do you square those two things? Uh, if Tar Minister isn't king until 1731, how is he the king sending the fleet in 1700? And actually, Christopher Tolkien uh, wrote about this discrepancy. He says, The date 1731 here given for the end of the rule of Tar Telperion and the accession of Tar Minister is strangely at variance with the dating, fixed by many references, of the first war against Sauron. For the great Numenorean fleet sent by Tar Minister reached Middle-earth in the year 1700. I cannot in any way account for the discrepancy. 
And by the way, rest in peace, Christopher Tolkien. He passed away last week. A terrible loss. And we can only thank him for giving us an insight into so much of his father's works and extending that the legacy of Tolkien, the family of Tolkien. But even he doesn't have an answer for this. Um, so it is, it is an interesting little conundrum. I think when it comes to the mystery of these various dates, I think one date that we have to take as in stone is the 1700 date. It's when the Navy arrives and defeats Sauron. I'm going to read you a passage here that sets that scene. Now, for long years, the Numenorians had brought in their ships to the Grey Havens, and there they were welcome. As soon as Gilgalad began to fear that Sauron would come with open war into Eriador, he sent messages to Numenor. And on the shores of Linden, the Numenorians began to build up a force and supplies for war. In 1695, when Sauron invaded Eriador, Gilgalad called on Numenor for aid. Linden calls for aid, and Numenor shall answer. Uh, then Tar Minister, the king, sent out a great navy, but it was delayed and did not reach the coasts of Middle-earth until the year 1700. By that time, Sauron had mastered all Eriador, save only besieged Imladris, and had reached the line of the river Loon. Gilgalad and the Numenorians were holding the Loon in desperate defense of the Grey Havens, when, in the very nick of time, the great armament of Tar Minister came in, and Sauron's host was heavily defeated and driven back. The Numenorean admiral, Kyriatur, sent part of his ships to make a landing further to the south. So a number of interesting things in that passage. One, uh, it looks like Tar Minister did not lead this navy. It's this admiral, Kyriatur. So I think Tar Minister stayed back in Numenor and sent the fleet. The fact that it was sent in 1695 but took five years to get there, and yet it says very clearly here, then Tar Minister the king sent out a great navy. And again, he uses that prefix Tar in front of his name. So by all rights, according to that passage, he is the king as early as 1695 sending out this navy. So could it be some kind of a reconsideration on Tolkien's part? Perhaps at one point he wanted Telperion to hand over the scepter on her deathbed, and then perhaps maybe later on in the story he thought it would work better if she handed over rulership earlier. It's possible. Maybe he just never wrote that down. Another possibility would be that maybe Minister was acting as regent, as we see later in the Third Age, when we've got Minilcar, later becomes Romendasil II, the guy who uh, commissioned the Argonoth to be built. Uh, he was a regent for a while, acting in, on behalf of Gondor. Um, that's possible as well. Perhaps there was some kind of civil strife, and Tar Minister is like, heck with this, we're, we're going to help Middle-earth um, because it's important to do, and you know, decided isolationism was not the way to go and did a break. I doubt that's the answer because I think then we would have heard more about the internal strife happening in Numenor at that time, and then we don't see that. So if you've got a theory for how King Minister sent a fleet 31 years before he became king, uh, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So that's a snapshot of the ruling family in Numenor around this time. It's like a large melodrama, an opera um, taking place here. But it certainly is going to be brought up in the Amazon series. Probably the elves, a la Galadriel, who's already been cast, and Elrond and Gilgalad, are going to be your central characters because of their lifespans, and you can cover a lot of story topics through them. But... You it's impossible to tell this story of the crafting of the Rings of Power and the One Ring and Sauron, uh, you know, revealing himself and then being defeated by the Numenorians without bringing up the Numenorians. So I believe we are going to see someone cast as Tar Telperion. Um, and it'll be interesting to see her relationship to this Tar Minister, her nephew. 
Um, and maybe this fight between isolationism and the need to go and aid the elves uh, at the time of their greatest need. So there you have it, the rulers of Numenor at the time of the forging of the rings of power. Hope you enjoyed that. If you've got a topic for a video that you'd like to see, put it in the comments below. I would love to do a video about a topic of your choosing. Uh, thanks so much, and fare thee well.